Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, this is Dr. Eric Goldstein. I'm one of the gastroenterologists uh, at New York Gastroenterology Associates. Um, and uh, I will be uh, the disembodied voice of, of the moderator here this evening. Um, tonight, we are lucky enough to uh, be joined uh, not by one expert, but by two experts to talk about uh, many issues related to the pelvic floor. Uh, uh, the pelvic floor is often an area of taboo and mystery, and we hope that tonight we'll clear up uh, a lot of these questions, or at least begin the discussion of a lot of these questions. Um, you will hear from a, a two experts. In fact, I think this is our first tag team approach uh, to a webinar at NYGA. Uh, you'll hear from Dr. Pashinsky, uh, a gastroenterologist and member of NYGA, uh, who has been uh, trained at Mount Sinai and has now been attending at Mount Sinai for quite a number of years, uh, and uh, certainly considered quite expert in this field. Um, and we are uh, pleased to be joined as well by Dr. Stacy Levine, uh, who is a uh, doctor of physical therapy. Uh, she obtained her degree from Columbia University, and she's been practicing now for 14 years as part of Zion Physical Therapy. Uh, she is a certified pelvic rehabilitation practitioner uh, through the her trained through the Herman and Wallace Institute, as well as an orthopedic certified specialist through the uh, American Physical Therapy Association. Um, she treats patients at Zion Physical Therapy's Upper East Side office location and helps to manage Zion PT's other three locations uh, uh, elsewhere in Manhattan, as well as Jersey City and Westport, Connecticut. Um, with that, um, I'll, I'll shut up now and let you guys begin. Oh, one last thing. I'm not going to shut up. Um, if you have questions, uh, please use the Q&A uh, function in the Zoom um, please do not use the chat. I won't be keeping an eye on that. I, I will be keeping an eye on the Q&A bar. Thank you. So I, I just want to give a, a big shout out to Stacy for joining me um, on, this, on this pelvic floor journey talk. Um, Stacy and her team have been an absolute uh, pivotal, important center point for so many of my patients um, that we have helped. Um, and I'm very lucky that she agreed to do this talk with me uh, for tremendous expertise. So since we could only uh, run this from one computer, I'm going to be the slide advancer as well as a co-presenter. So Stacy will be signaling me as to when it is time to advance the slide. So bear with us. Technology can only take us so far these days. Um, so with that, we'll get started. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Stacy Levine, uh, Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Przezinski. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I jumped at the chance to speak uh, at this presentation when Dr. Pshinsky asked me, um, as they are both brilliant and so wonderful with all of our patients. Um, a lot is known about orthopedic physical therapy and what is done and how those uh, symptoms are diagnosed. Um, and a lot is known about what happens in orthopedic physical therapy, but like Dr. Goldstein said, pelvic floor physical therapy, there's still not enough mainstream knowledge amongst healthcare professionals and definitely amongst patients. Um, and so I'm really excited to kind of shed a little bit more light on what pelvic, what the pelvic floor is, what pelvic floor dysfunction is, and what happens during a pelvic floor evaluation and follow-up treatment sessions. Um, so here we go. We're gonna start, I'm gonna start talking about just what is the pelvic floor? Um, Dr. Pashinsky is then going to take over and she's going to define how the pelvic floor relates to your gastrointestinal health. Um, she's going to discuss how the pelvic floor dysfunction is diagnosed. And then I'm going to take over and talk about um, how pelvic floor dysfunction is treated and what other issues besides GI and bowel dysfunction can be treated by pelvic health PTs. So what is the pelvic floor? The pelvic floor is a group of muscles housed within the bony pelvis that forms a sling and functions to provide what we call the five S's. The first S being support. It provides support to the pelvic organs, the bladder, the rectum, the uterus, all of the intestines that are sitting on top of it. Um, it's sphincteric in nature. It controls the opening of the bladder and the rectum. So it contracts to prevent leakage of stool and urine, and it relaxes to allow you to urinate and defecate. 
Um, it provides stability. It's an integral, integral part of the core and it works with your abdominal wall, your diaphragm, your hips, and your back muscles to kind of create a corset of support when you move. Um, it, it provides sexual function. It helps to achieve and maintain erections in men. It allows for penetration in women when it's allowed to relax fully and it helps with um, fulfilling orgasms. Um, the last function is what we call a sump pump. It acts as a blood and lymph pump for the pelvis. So dysfunction, dysfunction with this can lead to swelling or congestion in the pelvis, which acts as like a um, feeling of like fullness. Okay, so this is a picture of the muscles of the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm, if you will. The first, I'd say maybe 20 to 25 minutes of a physical therapy evaluation is really a lot of education and just making sure that the patients know what the pelvic floor is, why they were referred to pelvic floor physical therapy, that they know where the muscles are located. And I always have my, um, anybody in the healthcare profession is gonna know who Frank Netter is, my anatomy book out, my pelvic model out, and I'm going through each of the muscles and describing what they are, what they're called and how they function. So I'm just gonna do a brief overview here. Everything that you see in the picture and on this model in white is bone. You have your two, um, your two pelvic bones. You have your pubic symphysis in the front, if you guys can see me. You have your lumbar spine in the back, the sacrum in the back, and the tailbone. Again, everything in white is bone. Everything that you see in red, both on the picture and on my model here, is muscle. That's the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor is a group of muscles. And if you can see um, the top, this is a female pelvis on the picture and you're looking kind of like down into the pelvis. This is kind of looking from the opposite end. You have the urethral opening. Oh no, Stacy froze. Technical difficulties and she will be right back. I think Dr. Pashinsky, while we're waiting for Dr. Levine to come back, come back, this might be a good time to mention, as we discussed before, that although many of the diagrams show female anatomy, pelvic floor problems absolutely can and do uh, affect men uh, as well as women. It's not exclusively a female disorder. Yeah, not, not by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, actually, uh, you know, any, any men with prostate problems, uh, sexual dysfunction problems, as well as GI problems, you know, likely have a, you know, the pelvic floor is likely playing a large part in it. She's back. I'm so sorry. This is exactly what I hoped wouldn't happen when we have been practicing this all week. Um, okay, I'm going to get back to the pelvic model. You have the urethral opening at the top. You have the vaginal opening in the middle of the female pelvis, and you have the rectal opening at the bottom of the pelvis. And as you can see, everything in red here is muscle, and it surrounds all three openings. So if you have any tightness of the pelvic floor, you potentially could have constipation, you could have incomplete emptying, you can also have a number of urological issues and sexual dysfunction. We'll, we'll talk about a little bit later because I know the focus is more on bowel dysfunction here. Um, but just knowing that if there's tightness or restrictions or an inefficiency on how the pelvic floor works, it can lead to issues in the GI system. Um, on the other hand, if you have laxity in the connective tissue, if you have laxity in the pelvic floor, it can also lead to issues such as incontinence of stool um, or prolapse. Some people have been diagnosed with rectocele or rectal prolapse if there's connective tissue laxity and also a weakness of the pelvic floor. Next. Slide advance. Yeah. Okay, so um, now I'll kind of jump into talking a little bit about how all of this you know, and this whole muscle structure support relates to your gastrointestinal health. So obviously now that you know exactly what it is, where it is, uh, you could see how it could play a tremendous role um, in how you feel day to day. Um, it's clearly integral to bowel function. Um, commonly manifesting as constipation would be like the most common, although, um, you know, obviously other ideologies as we're going to get to. Um, and outlet dysfunction or dysfunction related to pelvic floor problems is actually thought to account for at least 50 or more percent of people who present with constipation of any type um, and uh, up to 75 percent of any constipation uh, that presents with difficult evacuation. Um, obviously vital to continence of uh, both your gastrointestinal and your urinary system. It very often presents with bloating, um, which is probably the most common complaint I see day to day. 
Uh, it presents with lower abdominal pain and pelvic pain, potentially due to congestion, stool buildup, or muscle tightness in its own right. And, um, you know, going into sort of further down, uh, you know, rectal pain, anal pain, hemorrhoids, and fissures, these are all things that could either be the result of pelvic floor dysfunction or actually the initiators of pelvic floor dysfunction for some. So very commonly, we have somebody who develops, you know, an anal fissure uh, for whatever reason, um, and uh, it causes them to have tremendous spasm and tightness, and it kind of becomes a vicious cycle. Um, and then, you know, uh, Stacey mentioned, you know, rectal prolapse and rectocele and sort of kind of more anatomical problems that can um, be the result of this. Um, we're also going to touch on APD a little bit during this talk, which is kind of the, the upside down cousin of pelvic floor dysfunction, but also a dyssynergia of your muscles that could lead to a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms and also could be addressed um, with pelvic PT and you know, PT geared towards this. Um, so I think all my patients on this webinar are, are uh, know exactly what this is about and you know what toothpaste is doing here, but um, I use the toothpaste analogy very often with my patients to explain how the pelvic floor uh, relates to their bowel function and um, you know, basically to have a uh, toothpaste come out of your toothpaste tube, you have to open the cap uh, before squeezing the tube. If the cap is closed, um, it doesn't matter how much you're squeezing that tube, you're not really gonna be able to get anything out. And there's gonna be a lot of pressure at the base of the tube, but not much happening. And vice versa, if the cap is wide open, um, you know, there could be spillage. And if the cap is wide open, but there's no squeeze happening, there may be nothing coming out. So this is kind of, you know, I think of the pelvic floor as the cap to that tube. Um, and kind of your colon and some of your other muscles internally are part of the, uh, sorry, the pelvic floor is the cap and the other muscles are part of the tube. Um, so how do we diagnose pelvic floor dysfunction? So first and foremost, um, talking to your doctor and explaining your symptoms and having the right questions asked is the way that we start understanding what's going on. So um, it's asking about bowel functions, asking about bloating, asking about pain. Um, this is where your doctor maybe asking about maneuvers that you may be using to evacuate. So whether you're struggling and straining, whether you're getting into funny positions on the toilet, whether you have to use your hand to manually extract stool or splinting, which is when women actually use um, a finger vaginally to try to push on the rectum uh, to try to extract stool that way. Um, this is patients who often need to use laxatives to the point of diarrhea in order to overcome tension. Um, or those who are having fecal incontinence, you know, both with diarrhea and even with solid stool. Um, this is uh, our patients who will often feel significantly worse, you know, the, the high tone pelvic floor patients will feel significantly worse when they've tried fiber in the past, which they thought was going to be so good for their constipation, uh, because it just causes a pressure buildup as opposed to um, the release that they're looking for. Um, information about non-gastro symptoms is also important. So as Stacey mentioned, um, this affects, you know, three different systems that are all down there. So asking about your sexual health, urinary function, and actually, you know, a pearl asking about TMJ um, and tooth grinding is important because um, it tends to kind of parallel or at least give us hints that this may be a problem across multiple compartments of your pelvic floor. Um, in terms of testing, so a simple um, uh, sorry, before even testing, I'm sorry, I skipped very importantly, the physical exam. So this is where we do a rectal exam. Um, and this is when your doctor would be inserting, um, you know, a gloved finger into the rectum and um, feeling for how tight your muscles are to begin with, you know, is there any discomfort related to that part? Um, this is about asking you to do certain maneuvers like squeezing and pushing to see if you're coordinating your muscles correctly, as well as your abdominal muscles. And it's actually a pretty sensitive test for pelvic floor problems. Doesn't quite necessarily give us the entire story as it relates to the pelvic floor. So the other test that we may use, um, is plain abdominal x-rays, which are super simple. Um, and often in pelvic floor dysfunction patients, we will see, particularly in the high tone dysfunction, we will see a large amount of stool buildup sort of in the rectum or rectus sigmoid as opposed to the rest of the colon. So the very bottom of the colon, right above the anal area. So kind of at the door, but can't quite get out of the door. Um, and then moving on are kind of the more intense tests, uh, which is anorectal manometry and uh, defecography testing. So um, anorectal manometry is actually a pretty simple office test, which we perform at NYGA. Dr. Goldstein is actually our manometry guru. And um, this is where um, you kind of clean the rectum before coming in with some enemas. And um, there's no sedation, there's no risk to this test whatsoever, and it takes about 15 minutes. A small catheter with a balloon attached is inserted rectally. Um, and is inflated to different volumes um, to test whether your rectum is the correct normal size um, and whether it has normal stretchability to it. 
Um, it checks uh, whether you sense um, appropriately, which would mean that you're able to sense stool because as Stacy will probably mention, uh, patients who have lack of sensation, uh, very difficult to treat with pelvic floor physical therapy because you need to have that ability to sense in order to retrain muscles. Um, it gives us a hint whether somebody may have a rectocele, uh, which is a bowing out of the rectum that may be abnormal. Um, and um, you do a few pushing and squeezing maneuvers that are measured by the sensors that would be um, uh, along the canal that let us know if you're coordinating your muscles correctly. It is also the only test that we have for you know, IBS, which everyone thinks they have, but usually don't, uh, because that would mean that your discomfort level to uh, insufflation of the balloon is lower. Uh, than expected. And, you know, we get, uh, so, you know, the little balloon, the test that you see is on the left of the screen. And then the results uh, that we get, you know, are kind of pressurization readings that we see actually in various types of dyssynergia, which I'll talk about in a second. So, um, you know, kind of to break it down, obviously, this is another, another way, a cross-sectional view of what Stacy was describing. And we're seeing that sort of pelvic floor muscles um, you know, so this is a cross-sectional area. So the sigmoid rectum and anal muscles, the uterus and the vagina, we're once again, unfortunately using a female model, but um, there's some similarities and Stacy will also have a male model um, later on and the urinary muscles. Um, and also not forgetting very importantly, your transverse abdominis, your abs and your multifidus muscles of the back are all part of this. So the types of dysfunction that you would be diagnosed with potentially at the time of your manometry um, or one through four to just kind of neatly lump them into categories. Um, so in the, you know, kind of type one classic type, you're able to push from the rectum. So you're able to generate that force abdominally in, in the rectum, but instead of relaxing and opening that cap and relaxing and opening that doorway, you actually end up contracting and tightening it further, which is obviously not very productive for bowel function. In type two dysfunction, not only do you contract here when you attempt to bear down, but you're not really pushing very much. Um, and um, type three and four sort of variants as well, where there's you know adequate or inadequate pushing and whether there's adequate or inadequate relaxation. Um, and the focus of your pelvic floor therapist may depend on kind of the type of dysfunction that we are facing. Um, Defecography um, comes in conventional and MRI versions. And this is basically, you guys are absolutely not meant to be, you know, MRI experts here, but it sort of shows you the difference in what we're seeing. This is dynamic imaging during a simulated defecation event. So this is kind of, um, you would be um, pushing down while you're in the MRI machine. So uh, the radiologists are able to dynamically visualize what happens within your pelvis and how all the organs interplay with one another at the time that you're defecating um, or trying to. So it basically gives us an idea and there's a lot of different angles that get measured here. Um, and it gives us ideas of kind of how this works, you know, what you're like at rest. Um, this is what normal defecation should be like where um, you have proper sensory perception to rectal distension. Um, you know, you contract the diaphragm, the abs and, you, and the rectal muscles, and then you relax your sphincter. And then what happens with the synergic defecation where instead you sort of tighten the sling um, and what happens with incontinence or a, a weak pelvic floor where, um, you know, you have either diminished capacity of the rectum or just the weakness of that puborectalis muscle. Um, and then just to talk a little bit about APD, because this could be sort of a talk in itself. Um, this is, like I said, you know, uh, sort of the upside down cousin of pelvic floor dysfunction. And it's, um, and also it's a misuse of your diaphragm and your abs. So this has to do with what's called the, you know, viscerous somatic reflexes. Um, normally when there's any sort of abdominal distension um, with anything, so gas, food, anything that um, increases intestinal distension, um, what the normal reflex of your body should be is that um, the diaphragm moves up as what you see here to make more space and your abs pull in. Uh, in people with APD, the opposite sort of happens um, where the diaphragm will drop down and the abs will relax tremendously. So these are our patients who come in, you know, super duper bloated. Um, it's definitely much more common in women, though it definitely affects men as well. Um, and this is, you know, uh, the classic, you know, patient would be, it's, it's our young, thin, 
women, thin young women who bring us their, you know, their pregnant selfies, um, because it's very extreme distension from sort of very minimal intake. And these are people that could bloat up very rapidly with just taking even a few sips of water or sort of very small volume that is not in line with other gastrointestinal disorders. Um, this is something that um, Europe has some pretty cool dynamic imaging for this, which we haven't quite gotten yet, um, and some cool new techniques, which we haven't quite gotten yet. But this is also something that could be um, uh, measured a bit better at the time of manometry. Um, so Dr. Goldstein in particular uses um, sort of tape around the abdomen um, in his uh, when he does his measurements, which actually will give us a more clear um, idea whether this is happening to somebody or not. Um, so um, now that you know what it is and what it can mean um, and all the different things that could um, be driven by pelvic floor dysfunction, um, now we should talk about how it is treated. And I think from this slide, you could kind of tell where I'm going with this. Um, and this is not the easiest and most convenient. And obviously everybody looks at me like I have three heads when I suggest that they need physical therapy for their tush but um, it's just another set of muscles that just happens to be located in a place that's, um, you know, you can't put in a sling or isolate or not use. This is what we're misusing on a daily basis as we sit on chairs, as we sit on toilets, as we, you know, walk on cement, as women wear heels. I mean, all of these things um, that are the foundation of your body and the important parts of your posture um, and correcting it the same way as you would any other injury is extremely important. Um, we obviously live in a pretty instant gratification culture uh, these days where everything's at your fingertips, there's an app for everything and uh, people wanna get better very fast. Um, but this is something that you really have to put time and effort into. There are a few things that we use as sort of a bit of adjunct um, treatment sometimes. So this is where um, a visit with um, a expert gastro specific dietitian, which by the way, plug NYGA has three soon to be four of, um, who understand pelvic floor dysfunction, they can really help streamline some dietary measures that will prevent the stool buildup or correct diarrhea or improve constipation that could really help your symptoms in line with your physical therapy. We sometimes use uh, medication, mainly these are muscle relaxants, um, sometimes even pain medications for those with pelvic pain um, as a result of their um, dysfunction. And in very rare cases, you know, depending on the anatomical defect, obviously a rectal prolapse, a large rectocele, which will not be corrected with physical therapy alone. Um, this is when surgery may be indicated, but also in conjunction with physical therapy, because if surgery is done on its own and there's no follow-up and there's no treatment, people are likely to end up exactly where they had started initially. So um, now Stacy is going to be the one to tell us all about how physical therapy works, what it entails, and what we should be expecting from a visit. Absolutely. So once you've finished your visits with Dr. Pashinsky and Dr. Goldstein, and you have your pelvic floor dysfunction diagnosis, and you have your script for physical therapy, you can call our office and our care coordinators will take care of you. Um, the gastrointestinal dysfunctions diagnosed that public PTs can help treat are some of what Dr. Pashinsky has already talked about, constipation outlet dysfunction, um, when the pelvic floor is typically hypertonic or too tight and it's not relaxing appropriately to allow stool to pass. Dyssynergia, exactly what Dr. Pashinsky was talking about, there are four types. Um, and based on which type you have, there are certain strategies that the pelvic PTs can help you retrain the efficiency of the pelvic floor in and of itself to help um, re-educate your system on how to void correctly. Um, incomplete emptying of stool, you know, sometimes people will come in and be like, yeah, I'm going every day, but like only a little bit comes out and then I am uncomfortable for the rest of the day or it's coming out a little bit throughout the day and I just don't feel empty and it's really uncomfortable. Um, fecal incontinence and gas incontinence can sometimes go hand in hand where you are losing stool or losing gas at inappropriate times. Um, rectal pain, this can be uh, rectal pain, coccyx pain, pain with sitting. Um, it can present in a couple of different ways, but it can be that the pelvic floor muscles that attach to the coccyx are too tight and it's pulling on their attachments and irritating uh, blood vessels and nerves. 
Proctalgia fugax is more of like a, an acute spasm. So some people will say, oh my God, out of nowhere, it just felt like my, my butt just like tightened up and it was so painful and I couldn't breathe. And then within sometimes 30 seconds to a minute, it just goes away. Sometimes that can be increased activity of the pelvic floor as well. Um, and doing relaxation exercises and stretching exercises and manual therapy can really help with that. Levator Ani syndrome, again, it's it, Levator Ani is a kind of grouping together of the coccygeus, iliococcygeus, and ischiococcygeal muscles that um, if you look at an anatomy book, you'll see are kind of uh, labeled individually, but it's hard to feel them individually. So they kind of group them together as Levator Ani, and that's just another diagnosis that you might see on your prescription. Um, abdominal bloating and distension, just like Dr. Pashinsky was talking about. Um, a backup of the stool and gas if your pelvic floor isn't relaxing appropriately can be really uncomfortable. Um, and abdominal phrenic dyssynergia. Um, Dr. Brzezinski and Dr. Goldstein are my go-to referral sources for this when we suspect that somebody has APD. It's a relatively, again, like she said, Europe is, is a little bit further ahead with some of their research with some of this, but through a lot of um, diagnosing and treating and a little bit of trial and error, we've gotten really good at um, evaluating this and treating it and, and having success with it. Okay, so what to expect during your pelvic floor PT evaluation? Um, so many patients are referred to pelvic floor PT and they really don't know what's gonna happen. They don't know what the pelvic floor is. They assume that they're gonna be out in the open. Um, and it's just, it's a completely different experience than what you would expect from if you tore your ACL or if you have low back pain or neck pain or rotator cuff surgery. Um, we at Zion Physical Therapy provide 45 minute one-on-one -on -one sessions in a private treatment room with only your physical therapist. There are no aids. Um, we send you all of your paperwork prior to your appointment. We're going to ask you every question under the sun as far as your pelvic health history, um, how many babies you've had, how long you've had the pelvic floor dysfunction, um, literally everything. We have a three-page questionnaire. Um, when you come into the office, you'll be greeted by your pelvic floor PT. They'll take you into a private treatment room. All evaluations are performed in private treatment rooms with only your physical therapist, and you are always welcome to have a chaperone or family member. Um, upon request or not even upon request, just bring them in with you. If you're more comfortable with someone in the office with us, um, I have definitely conducted sessions with, um, you know, teenagers or young adults with their parents. I've conducted sessions with women who want their husbands there, vice versa. And a lot of times it's really helpful to actually have somebody there to help you digest the information and then also help you um, reinforce what you're learning from your pelvic floor PT session at home. Um, so what do we do? We start with a full past medical history. So everything from your childbirth history to, you know, you were constipated as a kid. What did that look like as a teenager? You've started with suppositories, enemas, you're on laxatives. Um, what medications are you taking? What doctors have you been to? Have you seen a nutritionist, acupuncturist, GI, urogyne, everything? Um, or were your first stop? Uh, chief complaints and functional limitations. What is holding you back from doing what you want to do or from feeling how you want to feel is that you is it you can't go out because you're afraid that you're going to leak stool or gas is it that you are afraid to go out because you have to go all the time and you're afraid you're not going to find a bathroom um is it you're super uncomfortable and you don't want to go out and play tennis because you've been constipated and you haven't had a bowel movement in five days um all of these things we hear all the time and it is not uncommon but it's also not normal um, we do a full posture assessment. A lot of times things that we're doing in our daily lives, like sitting incorrectly, standing incorrectly, running incorrectly, a lot of that can have an effect on the length and tension of all of the muscles in the core, in the pelvic floor, in your hips, in your low back. An abdominal wall assessment for anyone who has had any kind of abdominal surgery, whether it be a C-section, your appendix removed, um, laparoscopic surgeries, any kind of scar tissue can affect your abdominal wall and how your viscera moves and how your muscles function. Um, any kind of fascial restrictions, any kind of muscle tension tightness, diaphragm restrictions, like in that APD diagnosis, a lot of times your diaphragm is just sitting lower than low and we need to get it to relax and kind of recoil. Um, women who have had pregnancies and have given birth, diastasis, the separation of your abdominal um, of your rectus abdominis, the two heads of it, that can lead to an inefficient core and therefore an inefficient pelvic floor. So these are all the things that we're looking for in abdominal wall assessment. 
Um, we're going to show you that little Bristol stool chart that you see to see what kind of um, stool type you have. And this is a good indication of, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good indication of, you know, if you do need to be referred to potentially a dietitian or just have a little bit more work with how to get your stool consistency to be optimal in that type three or type four range. Because if you're having diarrhea, if you're having really hard lumpy stools, it is much harder um, for even a good functioning pelvic floor to really eliminate correctly and hold stool in. So optimal stool consistency is vital. And then we get to the pelvic floor exam. So the first part of the pelvic floor exam is, you know, we, we do, we have sheets on the tables, we have gowns on the tables, the therapist leaves the room, we have the patient undressed from the waist down, we have them lie on their back on the table. And the first part of the exam is just a visual exam. We look at the pelvic floor and we see if there's any tissue inconsistencies. And also we have you squeeze, we have you do a contraction or a Kegel, if you will, to see if we can see an infolding of the tissues. If you have control over that movement, a lot of times when people don't have control over that movement, they use their abs, they use their glutes, they use their mouth, they use their toes, they use everything they possibly can to try to get this contraction and it's just not happening. So that is great information for us to know. Okay, they don't know what it is. We have to teach them how to do the contraction. You then need to be able to fully relax. A lot of times people with a hypertonic or tight pelvic floor will kind of get stuck in that contraction and they won't be able to let go. Um, and then you also need to be able to bulge. You need to be able to lengthen that tissue. You know, you can't live with your bicep in mid contraction or live here or live completely lengthened. You need full range of motion in order for the muscle to function efficiently. So that's what we're kind of gauging from just the visual assessment. And then the next part is an external muscle palpation. So again, taking the female pelvic floor, we use one gloved finger. We don't use any instruments when we're doing the assessment. And we're pressing on each of the superficial muscles of the pelvic floor, looking for any restrictions, tissue restrictions under our fingers, seeing if there's any tightness or tension or discomfort that the patient is experiencing. And we will also have you do a Kegel and see if we can feel the actual muscle contraction under our finger and see if it's symmetrical side to side. Um, the last part is either, usually if you're coming in with a bowel dysfunction, ideally we need to do a rectal canal exam. Um, rectal pelvic floor exam. If somebody's coming in with either an active anal fissure or active hemorrhoids, sometimes we will bypass um, the rectum. And if it's a female, we can do an internal vaginal assessment to assess the pelvic floor as well. But ideally in men and women, we want to do a rectal assessment to really assess what's going on with that external anal sphincter, internal anal sphincter. You heard Dr. Pshinsky say puborectalis, the levator ani, the superficial and the deep muscles to see what's going on from a tissue perspective. Is there tightness? Is there tenderness? Is there a reproduction of your symptoms when we insert our finger and press on each of these muscles? And then testing strength. We wanna test your ability to have a power hold, which is indicative of your fast twitch muscle fibers. So why would you need this strength? When you are coughing, sneezing, laughing, when you're lifting something up, and you have to go to the bathroom, you need this like pretty solid squeeze in order to hold back gas or stool. Um, for the endurance testing, we pretty much have you squeeze and hold and see if you can sustain a contraction. Um, I always use this analogy. If you're in Target, which is a pretty big department store, if you're not in Manhattan, if you're on one end and you need to go have a bowel movement and the bathroom is like a half mile away at the other end of the store, you need to be able to squeeze and hold to maintain continence in order to get to the bathroom to then relax and let yourself go. So we're, we're testing both. We're testing both power, we're testing endurance, um, and, then, and we're also looking for any myofascial restrictions present that could be limiting full contraction and full lengthening of the muscle. Um, other things we're looking at is hip range of motion, flexibility and strength. Your hip muscles, namely your adductors, your, your hip flexors, your hamstrings, your glutes, they all attach to bony prominence, prominences along your pelvis that are so closely related to where your pelvic floor sits. If you have tension in any of these um, low back muscles or hip muscles, it can create overflow tension into your pelvic floor. So we're looking at the body as a whole. Um, most of our, most if not all of our physical therapists at Zion Physical Therapy are also orthopedic therapists. And I think that is super important because you are not just looking at the pelvic floor muscle group individually. It is part of a whole person and 
a part of what you do on a daily basis. So you really need to get a full picture of what's happening um, in order to really treat these dysfunctions fully. Um, and the last thing, I typically don't get to biofeedback in the first session, just because as you can see, there's a lot to unpack and talk about in that first session. Um, but biofeedback is a wonderful assessment tool. And I'm gonna go into that um, in the next couple slides on how we do it and what it's used for. Um, it basically provides an objective measurement to everything that I'm telling the patient during the evaluation. Okay, so after we've done a thorough assessment, how is pelvic floor dysfunction treated? Um, a lot of people think it is a blanket treatment as far as you do 10 sets of Kegels, 10 times a day, everything will be cured. And the truth is, it's absolutely nothing like that because your treatment is based on the results of a thorough evaluation of how your pelvic floor muscles function, not just your pelvic floor, your hip and your low back and your core and your posture and everything that we just went over. So it is definitely not a one size fits all approach. Um, and it really makes me sad when people think that it is because it, a lot of times your symptoms are not gonna get better and you're not gonna think PT is gonna work because you're not doing the most appropriate things for your particular symptoms and for your body. Um, so I'm going to run through these because we have slides uh, following that I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with. Um, but one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is manual therapy. Because we have those 45 minutes one-on-one -on -one with someone, we can really dive in to releasing tight musculature trigger points both externally and internally in the pelvis, um, but also via the vaginal and or rectal canal if necessary. Um, we do a ton of neuromuscular re-education, which is really retraining the muscles to contract relax and bulge appropriately. We do a lot of stretching and strengthening, both us stretching you and you doing stretches at home and a ton of strengthening to the core and pelvic floor when appropriate. Biofeedback we use pretty regularly. Dilator therapy, again, I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more detail later. Anorectal balloon retraining. This is kind of a follow-up to the anorectal manometry. Um, it's similar, but we, we retrain different things. And again, I'll go into that a little bit later. Toileting strategies are huge. Squatty potty, how many people have heard of a squatty potty? It is your best friend when you are trying to have a bowel movement. Um, I don't know why they make toilets so high and Dr. Vashinsky and I have had this conversation. Yeah, I mean, they're doing it because people have really weak quads and it's easier to get up from basically a seated position than a squat. Right, but you are basically putting your puborectalis at an inefficient angle and you're making it work that much harder in order to get a bowel movement. Yeah, I mean, I, I tell patients that, you know, the toilet is about a hundred years old. We have certainly not evolved to use it and it's not going to happen during our lifetime. So we have to make the best of what we've got, not telling you to rip yours out, but, you know, maybe making some adjustments that would be more conducive to uh, good bowel health is important. Right. So squatty potty it is. They're, they're like 20 bucks online. Order from yeah. But even, I mean, I tell people, you know what, like if you can't fit that one or you, you're too embarrassed to have one, any sort of step stool, the folding ones with the little handle, they tuck behind your toilet. You could literally make it match your tiles if you want. They come in every color and they're going to do about the same job. So it's it's definitely better than the regular version. Absolutely. Um, posture education, modification. We were talking a lot about that before. You see this little posture um, image that I have here. These are a little bit exaggerated, but when you look at somebody's posture, you can really see how um, certain muscles can be tight and or lengthened and or weak based on how you're standing. So we do a lot of stacking where you want to make sure the head is over the rib cage, is over the pelvis, is over the feet. Um, and there's a lot of tactile cueing that we do and just practice um, taping techniques. Sometimes I take people in their proper posture so that when they go out of their proper posture, they feel a tug and they're reminded to go back in to it. Um, we can also use taping to enhance mobility or stability. Um, and then collaboration with your other healthcare providers. Again, we are so low volume that we're really lucky that we have the time to coordinate with gastroenterologists, your nutritionist, your acupuncturist, your OBGYN, your urologist, pain management, whoever is part of your team. A lot of times the bowel dysfunction patient population that we see, it, it, it takes a village, so to speak. Um, and a lot of times it's a multidisciplinary approach. Um, so we really, you know, we really try to have proper communication with all of your providers to get the best outcome possible. And then Dr. Goldstein's favorite home exercise program. Um, you are in physical therapy for, if you're, if, if you're lucky and insurance is covering it once a week, sometimes if you're really lucky twice a week, sometimes three times a week, if you know, all the stars align, but it's only 45 minutes. And a lot of times these dysfunctions are a result of um, certain patterns and habits that happen throughout your day and throughout your life. So 
really taking to heart what we say and what we're asking you to do as far as breathing strategies, toileting strategies, stretches, strengthening, um, you know, apps that we recommend, you know, really taking all of that to heart and kind of incorporating it into your daily life for a period of time until your symptoms start to improve or resolve. And then you can get into more of like a maintenance program that it's not taking up a lot of your time, but there is, you know, Dr. Kuczynski said it's, it's a conservative approach and it does take work on the patient's part. Um, and we're guiding and we're teaching and we're educating, but we really emphasize, you know, a partnership with our patients to get, to get the, uh, optimum result. Yeah, and, and I, I echo Stacy that, you know, I speak to uh, pelvic PTs pretty much every day. I'm speaking to, you know, to someone's therapist because we're readjusting, you know, I'm, I'm getting feedback from a patient on, on something, but then, you know, when I speak to the therapist, you know, it's getting an objective view of how they're doing. It's, it's us tweaking certain things. It's, you know, one um, alerting the other of some issues that may be going on, setbacks, changing management. It's very important. Okay. So diving into a little bit more detail on what is actually done during the physical therapy sessions, you've had your evaluation. We've like confirmed the diagnosis that Dr. Bashinsky or Dr. Goldstein has given you or any gastroenterologist or any of your providers who are referring you to us, but then what happens in the follow-up sessions? Um, typically for the first several sessions, we'll kind of dive into the manual therapy, mainly because if there is a mechanical um, dysfunction that is happening within your tissues, it usually needs a little bit of manual work to help either release the tight structures or get something firing that's not firing. Um, and it needs a little bit of hands-on help. So the first, a lot of times what we do is an abdominal or colonic massage. We do very gentle visceral mobilizations. Um, and we just, with the abdominal colonic massage, we're essentially following the path of the large intestine to kind of help increase peristalsis and just kind of help everything kind of move through your system correctly. Um, also noting any restrictions in the iliacus muscle and the psoas muscle in your diaphragm, um, and even just tender points. A lot of times people hold a lot of tension or are uncomfortable in their abdomen. And sometimes just doing the abdominal massage kind of decreases your sympathetic nervous system response and increases your parasympathetic nervous response, nervous system response, um, and calms everything down. For patients who have tight diaphragms, definitely the APD population, but even patients who just have high tone in general, I find that they have a lot of abdominal tension. They've been holding in their core because unfortunately society kind of encourages that. Their diaphragms are super tight. Um, their upper abs are super tight and potentially weak. And so releasing the diaphragm can just free up a lot of that abdominal wall tension and ribcage tension. And we teach breathing strategies in addition to this to kind of help, again, the system kind of work a little bit more efficiently. Um, we provide external myofascial and or trigger point release to the pelvic floor, lumbar area and hip musculature, internal myofascial and trigger point release to both superficial and deep musculature by a vaginal and or rectal canal, whichever is more appropriate for your particular situation. All of this manual therapy, especially the, ex the external and really the internal manual therapy is all to the patient's tolerance. So, the idea is that if you have tight muscles, we are going in again with one glove finger, we're pressing on the muscle, we're trying to stretch the muscle, we're having you do breathing exercises, do bulging exercises. If you are in pain and you're guarding, there's, there's no point in doing what we're doing. So there's no reason for us to kind of push through and have someone be uncomfortable. It's all to patient tolerance. And sometimes this takes a couple of sessions to kind of get used to. Sometimes people are totally fine with it on the first session. Some people defer and say, I want to do all the external stuff, but I really highly encourage um, patients to at least do one evaluation because we really don't know the whole story until we do the internal assessment. Um, manual stretching to bilateral hips and then joint mobilization to the hips, the lumbar spine, the coccyx, the sacrum, the SI joints, whatever is tight and restricted upon evaluation, that's what we're gonna go after during uh, treatment. And here, this bottom picture, um, the right pelvic floor is the female perennial area and the left one, oh, thank you, is the, male, <laughs> is the male pelvic floor. So even though obviously there's different anatomy that differs between men and women, you can see that they've kind of color-coded the musculature to be very similar. It's very similar musculature down there. It's just slightly different anatomy. So we're basically addressing very similar things. Um, it's just obviously with females, there are two canals to kind of work with versus, versus one in the men. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think to echo Stacy, um, it is very, you know, they're extremely public expertise, are extremely cognizant of people's limitations, of people's fears, anxieties. Obviously, a lot of people with pelvic floor dysfunction, both male and female, have had sexual trauma, um, you know, abuse as children, adults, and um, a lot of kind of emotional um, issues go into this at the same time. So uh, these are things that you're asked about. These are things that they will know about, be very respectful of, and nothing is ever done that you feel uncomfortable with, which, you know, people really think that they're going to um, you know, kind of experience something extremely unpleasant and have no control. And that's not at all what this is about. Absolutely. Okay, so here we're going to get into a little bit more about biofeedback and neuromuscular electrical stimulation. Biofeedback is a great tool that we have at all uh, three offices, I believe. Um, it's use of a, I have it right here, use of the pathway MR15 unit um, to basically assign objective measurements to pelvic floor muscle activity, both at rest and with muscle contraction. So if someone is having a really hard time kind of understanding when we do the internal assessment, um, just by me saying, okay, your pelvic floor is tight or your pelvic floor is weak or you're squeezing, but you're not really squeezing that hard. It's sometimes hard for people to understand that if they're not really sure what they're doing. So we typically recommend biofeedback for patients who need a little bit more help in understanding how to contract the pelvic floor appropriately, how to relax appropriately. Um, it's that top picture. Again, I'm not sure if you can see me on the picture, but um, that's the biofeedback that unit that we use. And we use a, there are external sensors that we can use. Again, the um, more accurate measurement um, is taken with an internal rectal sensor or again, an internal vaginal sensor, if that's more appropriate for your particular issue. Um, the sensor itself has little metal strips on it that when inserted, you don't feel anything, but it picks up the electrical activity of the muscle and it creates a numeric output onto the screen. And we can at that point see what your pelvic resting tone is like for this particular unit. Normal resting tone is 3.0 millivolts and below. So just by inserting the sensor and turning on the machine, we get a sense of, are you resting with too much muscle activity, too much tightness, too much tone? Um, is your number really low and there's weakness and laxity in the system? And it gives us information on where we need to start. If your number is really high, we need to start with what we call down training or relaxation training um, before we start with strengthening. If you have a system that's too tight and you start off immediately with strengthening, you might just make your symptoms worse because you're taking a tight system and making it tighter. Um, so if you have high tone, we're trying to bring it down to normal tone first. If you start off with low tone and you have a history of prolapse or incontinence, we are going right into the strengthening and we're setting goals with the biofeedback unit for you to then squeeze and try to reach certain numbers and hold it for a certain amount of time. Um, that exercise prescription is patient dependent. Again, it is not a one size fits all as far as strengthening goes. Um, it really is dependent on if you can squeeze for one second, great, your goal is two seconds. If you can squeeze for five, awesome, your goal is seven seconds. So again, it's, it's really dependent on your particular pelvic floor. Um, but the biofeedback is a great tool and a lot of people love it so much that they ask me if they are home units, which there are, um, the Kegel, the LV, there are a number of different units on the market that you can purchase for home use. If this is something that you feel really useful, um, to have to either do down training, relaxation training or up training. And what, um, we have patients do is purchase those machines, bring them into the office. I set them up for you. We practice with it. And then you go home and you do your homework. Um, the neuromuscular electrical stimulation machine, this guy right here, that middle picture. Um, this is, we use a pathway uh, STM10 vaginal and rectal intracavity stimulator. This is more to elicit muscle contraction to aid in proper contraction of the pelvic floor. So for the patients who just don't understand how to contract their pelvic floor and I can't get them to do it with verbal cueing, I can't get them to do it by using my finger and stretching, they just can't do it. We use the same rectal sensor um, or vaginal sensor. We hook it up to the machine and the machine, when we turn it up, creates a small impulse to the muscle tissue, which alerts the patient, oh, this, this is the muscle that she's trying to have me contract. Um, and what it does is it cycles on and off. It'll give you an impulse for however long we set it to, whether it's five seconds, 10 seconds. We have you contract with the machine 
And then when the machine shuts off, you rest. And it's a on and off cycle for, to, you know, however, however long you can tolerate or five to 10 minutes, whatever we feel is appropriate. And it just helps recruit some of those muscle fibers that people are having trouble facilitating and using. Um, and it creates a little bit more of a jump start to the system to then be able to do their strengthening exercises and or use the biofeedback. There are home NMES units also. Okay, anal rectal balloon retraining. So just as Dr. Pachinski was talking about the uh, anal rectal manometry, this is kind of a follow-up to that test. So it's a use of a small balloon attached to a tube that's attached to a syringe um, that we either fill with air or water that's used to re-educate proper sensation and urge to defecate. So in your anal rectal manometry testing, there are normative values as far as how much the balloon inflates. I think normal, Fill volume is 50 cc's. Am I right with that? Eric, chime in for this one. Sorry, yeah, uh, 50 sounds good. 50, okay, so 50 cc's. So a lot of times people with a stretched colon or a mega colon, they're not gonna feel it at 50 cc's. They're gonna feel it at like 200 or 250, like way too much. And what that equates to is having your rectum filled with stool but not feeling that it's filled with stool. And all of a sudden you have this giant piece of stool that you're trying to get out and it's, and it's not gonna be easy because there's so much collected there. Um, on the other hand, you might have somebody who has hypersensitivity and they're feeling the filling sensation around like 10 cc's. And that's when you have patients who have more of that like um, bowel hypersensitivity and they're um, having more urgency. Like they feel like they have to go all the time when they really don't because they're, their rectum isn't complying enough with what's sitting in there. So if you have a abnormal reading on your anovectal manometry, as far as sensation and filling goes, this is a great tool to use to kind of retrain that sensation. So if somebody has bowel urgency, we're inserting the balloon, we're filling it up to that 10 where you feel it, and then we're doing desensitization contractions and exercises to try to get everything to comply a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, so you have a normal urge. Um, and we're doing the same thing on the opposite end. We're filling it up to the point where you feel sensation if it's too stretched and then slowly letting the air out, letting the volume out and trying to have you do exercises so that you feel more normal sensation at a more normal capacity. Okay, dilator therapy and pelvic wands. These are super useful tools. Um, for in-person use, but mainly for home use, dilator therapy is used to gradually circumferentially stretch the vaginal and or rectal opening and canal. So patients with that proctalgia fugax, people with levator spasm, people with external anal sphincter spasms. Um, if we are doing manual therapy and we're stretching and we're stretching and we're stretching and it's just not happening where everything is relaxing the way that we want it to, sometimes the use of dilator therapy, which are the top um, cylinders at home, it's graded. Usually for my, don't get scared of the bigger ones. Those are usually for like a vaginismus diagnosis when people can't have intercourse. We're using the bigger ones to kind of simulate intercourse. Usually with the um, dilators for uh, bowel dysfunction, we're using the smaller ones to kind of stretch the external anal sphincter and the opening of the anal canal. Um, to allow for that stool to pass through. So it's just a way to reinforce some of the manual therapy we're doing in session in PT at home. Again, if you're only coming in once a week, sometimes we just need that manual therapy done a bit more frequently to see results. Um, the pelvic wand, this one's from Intimate Rose. I love this company. Um, again, use at home more so to perform internal soft tissue releases by the vaginal or rectal canal. Um, Again, just to reinforce what we're doing in the clinic to decrease some of those trigger points. I use this a lot for my pelvic pain patients, rectal pain patients, coccyx pain. Um, it's really very effective. Um, so back to our main question, to Kegel or not to Kegel? It's a loaded question, right? Like it's not a clear cut answer by any means. Um, a Kegel is a pelvic floor contraction or up training as we call it, it's a pelvic floor contraction geared to improve strength and endurance. When should you be doing Kegels? When you have a confirmed weakness and or laxity in the pelvic floor musculature causing symptoms, 
when should you not be doing kegels when should you potentially be doing down training or bulging or reverse kegels that's more an exaggerated relaxation geared to geared to decrease tone or pain or overactivity when should you be doing those when you have confirmed hypertonicity and tightness of the pelvic floor causing your symptoms how do you know what's right for you go get evaluated by your gastroenterologist who knows how to diagnose this and then go get help from a pelvic floor PT who can do that evaluation, assess you and your musculature and assign the most appropriate exercises for your body. Yeah, it's exactly like with anything else, you know, there's no one size fits all for these and everybody's story, symptoms, presentation, may be a little bit different, even though it's, you know, lumped under pelvic floor dysfunction. So this is where that individual approach is so important. Um. So this, the focus of this talk has been bowel pathology um, and gastrointestinal health. And I literally can make another four hour webinar on this slide alone. And I promise I'm gonna try to keep, I'm gonna try to keep it short. What other issues can be treated by pelvic health PTs? Um, you saw in that first demonstration of where the pelvic floor is located, that it surrounds the urethra, it surrounds the vaginal canal and it surrounds the rectal canal. So there are a number of different urinary dysfunctions, including incontinence. Um, SUI is stress urinary incontinence that usually happens where there's an increase in intra-abdominal pressure, either with sneezing, coughing, laughing, lifting, and you leak urine. Urge incontinence or UI is <laughs> you've been driving for a really long time, you have to go to the bathroom, you rush to your door, you get the key in the door, you have to go, you have to go, you have to go, you leak because you're not able to kind of restrict the flow of urine, key and door syndrome, as we call it. And then mixed, it both can happen, unfortunately. Um, overactive bladder, this is when one is going too frequently throughout the day. I have patients coming in saying that they are urinating every 30 minutes. Um, and it's, that's not normal. Five to seven times a day is what's considered normal or every two to four hours, depending on how much you sleep at night. Interstitial cystitis, this is usually diagnosed by a urologist. It's inflammation of the bladder lining. Pelvic floor physical therapists aren't necessarily gonna do anything to resolve the interstitial cystitis issue. However, if somebody is in pain and they're urinating frequently and it's uncomfortable, chances are they have kind of created a guarding pattern, which creates a tight pelvic floor, which can then perpetuate symptoms. So we're focusing on releasing tissue in the abdomen. We're focusing on releasing tissue in the um, pelvic floor, we're working on bladder retraining, those types of things. Nocturia is going to the bathroom at night more than once. Once can be normal. If you're pregnant, maybe a little bit more than once is normal. <laughs> but going to the bathroom more than once at night is, is really not normal. So creating strategies around trying to decrease the amount of time you're going at night and increasing bladder capacity so you don't feel like you have to go all the time. Um, and burning and frequent urination can also be a result of a tight pelvic floor. It's a, a symptom. Prenatal, prenatal postpartum, I love seeing prenatal and postpartum patients. Um, they are, they're great to work with. And I really feel like this is an area where, you know, women's health, it's just, it's so underserved. And really, I, I really feel like Every pregnant person should be seeing a pelvic health PT and right. certainly every postpartum patient at their six week visit follow up with their OB should be sent to pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, and in some countries they are. I mean, in, are. in some slightly more civilized countries, uh, pelvic floor physical therapy is part of normal postpartum recovery 100% of the time. This is just kind of like normal postpartum care. And, you know, here, unfortunately, it's not really talked about at all, um, you know, unless there's something really atrocious that happened at delivery, perhaps. Right. Um, and, you know, and the obstetricians, they're, they're doing their job and making sure that the tissue is healing correctly, that, um, you know, if they've had a C-section, everything's healing correctly, um, and that there's no over tissue dysfunction. However, a lot of women don't necessarily say, I'm still leaking. I'm still in pain. I can't, you know, I don't know how to get back to exercise. You're telling me I can exercise, but like, what does that mean? I used to run marathons. There's no way that I could have gone right back to my like previous activity at six weeks postpartum, like zero, zero way. Um, so pelvic pain in the prenatal postpartum period, symphysis pubis dysfunction. Again, this joint right here, you have a lot of, um, 
relax in coursing through your system and a lot of laxity that happens in the system as a result of your body allowing your baby to grow inside of you that happens and a lot of times that can lead to pain in joints that are typically very stable that are not so stable now um, diastasis rectus abdominis this is normal to happen in pregnancy however once you've delivered the baby not not everyone immediately goes back to their normal resting point of their rectus abdominis muscle. Sometimes there's a little bit of a separation in the abdomen, um, laxity in the connective tissue kind of right down the center. And if you're not retraining that appropriately, sometimes it doesn't just automatically come back and that can lead to core weakness, low back pain, um, pelvic floor dysfunction, things like that. Um, core weakness, a return to activity. Again, I touched on that before. A lot of people don't know where to start at that six week clearance that they get from their provider. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean I can walk? Does that mean I can do sit-ups? Does that mean I can run? It's different for everybody because we don't know where you're starting from. We don't know what um, your pregnancy and postpartum health has been like. Um, if you were on bed rest for the last 10 weeks of your pregnancy, you're not gonna be allowed to run at six, you shouldn't run at six weeks postpartum. Um, lower back pain is pretty common. And then prolapse, um, you know, rectocele, uterine prolapse, urethroceal, cystocele, essentially any of the organs that are kind of resting on the pelvic floor, if there is now laxity in the system from a vaginal delivery, sometimes even from a C-section, just having the weight of the baby sitting on your pelvis for nine months um, can create some laxity in the system. Um, if you had uh, an episiotomy or a tear, um, doesn't matter what grade, it, it really needs to be assessed. The scar tissue needs to be assessed. Um, it can be a source of pain and dysfunction for sure in the postpartum population. Um, pain in general, lower back pain, pelvic pain, abdominal pain, SI joint dysfunction, hip groin pain, all can be treated by a pelvic health PT um, from both the pelvic PT perspective, but also from the orthopedic perspective. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then sexual dysfunction, dyspareunia is pain with sex. Um, vulvodynia is kind of pain. It can be numbness or burning in the vulva. Vaginismus is the inability to have penetration, either from a partner, a tampon, a finger, like nothing. You can't have pap smears because they can't get the instrumentation in. It's almost like an involuntary spasm of the muscles of the pelvic floor, and it is super painful, and it feels like people are just kind of hitting a wall, and there's no way to get inside the system. Um, that is a great uh, time where we use dilator therapy, for sure. Um, pain with erections, ejac ejaculation, or orgasm. A lot of times this has to do with too much tension in the system. Um, and then again, pain with tampon use and or gynecological exams. Uh, we see young women in here all the time who are either unable to use tampons, who are unable to have a gynecological exam or a pap smear because they can't tolerate the instrumentation. Um, and again, everything is to the patient's tolerance. So there are a number of different ways to go about this. All of our public health PTs have a number of like tools in the toolbox, so to speak. So we start slow and we progress you to the point where you're um, a little bit more comfortable with maybe some of the more internal therapy and some of the home modalities that we use. But all in all, it's, it's definitely not a one size fit all approach. And just looking at this chart, you can have not just bowel dysfunction, not just sexual dysfunction, not just urinary dysfunction. It can be what we call a trifecta. Somebody can have all three and we're trying to decipher what issues are coming from where. Um, and a lot of times we can be very successful with really resolving all of it by treating the pelvic floor. So thank you, Stacy, for enlightening us. I think, you know, my stuff was way more straightforward and simple. And I think your stuff was a more mystifying part of it. Um, I think sort of, I'll start, I know Eric, um, Dr. Goldstein has been, you know, amassing questions, I'm sure. Um, sort of a question from me or more, you know, partially question, partially statement is that um, not all PTs are created equal. And I think as a patient, you guys should really be aware of that. So I think the beautiful thing about uh, working with my Zion therapist is that they are both ortho and pelvic trained, which means they kind of look at the entire person. But Stacey, if you could maybe comment a little bit on the differences in um, certain pelvic training, because, um, you know, uh, there's, it, it's not just a, I am pelvic trained. There are multiple kind of subspecialty areas and your therapist, as you could see, this is a very complex network of muscles that spans multiple 
organ systems. Um, and if you're not being treated by someone who specializes in your particular issue, you may not get the right outcome. Yeah, and this is this is kind of a little bit of a tricky topic. So my most, um, I graduated in 2008. And when I went to Columbia, the women's health um, wasn't even a program. It was an elective weekend seminar. Um, I, I chose to take it. And ironically, I was like, nope, this isn't for me. And then four years later, or whatever it was, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm in it. Let's do this. Um, but there was very little training when I went to school. I think most PT programs now, I think NYU, I think Columbia, I think they have more extensive training where they're doing education and lab work with PTs, but not every school does that or incorporates that into their curriculum. Um, a lot of the train, most of my, if not all of my training came after I graduated from PT school through um, the Herman and Wallace Institute is where I did all of my training. The American Physical Therapy Association also has a women's health training where you can get certified as a women's health certified specialist, a WCS. Um, I'm a pelvic rehabilitation practitioner, certi certified therapist, PRPC. Um, so if I, not everybody who treats women's health needs those letters behind their name, but someone can call themselves a women's health PT and have only taken one course, just focusing on female anatomy and the vaginal canal, or you can have somebody who has taken eight and has extensive knowledge and extensive education and experience in treating men, women, GI dysfunction, urinary dysfunction, and sexual dysfunction. It's really hard to tell sometimes from people's bios or credentials who has done what. So I think it, it makes sense for someone to call in and really ask questions, even request to speak to the PT where they're trying to pair you with and see you know, these are my, this, this is what I've had done to kind of diagnose my pelvic floor dysfunction. These are the symptoms that I'm having. Do you do internal manual therapy? Do you have biofeedback? Do you have NMA? Like using some of those terms and seeing how they respond. Um, because unfortunately I would, I would love to say that all pelvic health PTs are equal and it's, and it's just. Yeah. No, and, and I've seen it, you know, over and over and, you know, obviously, you know, you have, and, and, you, you know, you've been the, the, the next person trying to fix my patients, but I think this is where you guys have to advocate for yourselves and really know, you know, is this person trained to deal with males? You know, have they done the male course? It's not just an exact extrapolation. Um, you don't do it exactly the same, you know, are they comfortable doing gastro work? Because I've had, you know, many patients who, you know, are saying, oh, PT is, you know, has never worked for me. And, you know, their primary issues are all rectal, but they've never had even a rectal, you know, exam as much done. They've just had vaginal work the whole time because uh, their focus was different. So I think this is where you guys really have to advocate and find out if this is the right fit for you. And there should be some improvement happening. Would you say about eight-ish sessions, you know, that you should start seeing change, you should start seeing something. And if you're not, it's, it's sort of something to bring up and discuss. And it definitely depends, you know, I, that's a good point to bring up too. We didn't really discuss frequency or um, length of time that somebody is in PT. And again, it, it is really all patient dependent. If you've had these issues upwards of five, 10, 15, 20 years, it is going to take some time to unravel everything that has been such a learned response within your system. It, it can take months. It, I've had a couple of patients where it's not been consistent therapy for a year, but it's been consistent therapy for several months. They go home, they do their homework, they don't see me for a couple of months, they have a flare up, they come back in, we fix what's wrong, they go, they go back and live their lives. Um, some of the postpartum women, it's a lot quicker because it's, it's basically a trauma to your system that happens and we just need to kind of put the pieces back together, so to speak, and it's a little bit less of an intense course of therapy. Um, it, it's really it's really dependent. Um, some people see results quicker within just a few sessions. Other people, it definitely takes a little bit longer than eight sessions, but I think just being open with your therapist and noticing small changes. It, nothing's gonna disappear overnight. It's usually a gradual fix, um, but we're here to take our time and to you know just do as thorough of a job as we can. Eric, do you wanna do you wanna get some of the audience? Questions? Yeah, I will try and get a couple of questions in. But first, let me thank you both for a fabulous job. This was wonderful. Um, I, I'm very impressed by both the breadth and the depth, uh, which you guys can get into this. Uh, you know, seemingly sort of just off the top of your heads very easily. Uh, obviously. 
um, you know, that, that connotes a great deal of understanding and a great deal of skill. Um, we had um, a number of questions um, and perhaps the title predisposed and led to these. There are a lot of questions about Kegels. Um, <laughs> What is the right way? Up. What is what is the right way to do it? What is the wrong way to do it? How strong is strong enough? When can they be helpful? What types of incontinence do they work for? And things like that. Um, so what I'm going to ask um, is if you can kind of give us a, a bare bones explanation of how to properly do it, uh, and talk briefly about the two or three conditions where you might recommend them most commonly. Sure. Um, so Kegels, again, are the pelvic floor contractions. So it's most often used in diagnoses where you are gonna want to increase strength right away, usually in our incontinence patients and usually in our, whether it's urinary or fecal incontinence, gas incontinence, um, or in the prolapse patient population where there is known laxity in the system and weakness in the system. Those are the two diagnoses that I would say are pretty, that we pretty commonly use Kegels kind of right off the bat um, with a caveat of there could potentially be tension in the system that we have to address first before we start doing Kegels. And the only way to know that is to have an evaluation. However, if we're going to kind of do a little bit more of a blanket statement, the incontinence and the prolapse are the one or the two diagnoses that are going to respond pretty quickly to a Kegel regimen. Just as we were talking before about the evaluation and how we assess power and endurance, the exercise prescription, the Kegel prescription, again, is not a one size fits all, but typically we're doing short, like 100% intensity contractions for like one to three seconds, maybe 10 repetitions. Um, and then we're also doing endurance uh, holds where it's more of like a 10 second hold 10 times um, to get both the slow twitch fibers and the fast twitch fibers that are going to help um, with both the power and endurance activities that you're having trouble with. Um, there was one more point I wanted to make. Oh, also we, you know, we don't just do, we don't just prescribe Kegels lying down because a lot of times when people are leaking, it's not when they're lying down, it's when they're sitting up or going from sit to stand or walking or running. So you have to functionally train your body to respond the way that you want it to when you're doing those activities. So if you're leaking with standing, we're gonna give you Kegels in standing. We're gonna give you short, quick squeezes and we're gonna give you long prolonged holds as well. Um, typically, I guess, you know, the average exercise prescription, we're doing like three second holds 10 times, um, twice a day, 10 second holds 10 times twice a day. But again, if you can't hold it for 10 seconds, there's no point in doing it for 10 seconds. We have to drop it down to either three or five, depending on what you are able to do. Thank that you. The question. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Uh, we, we also got a lot of questions about relationship between pelvic floor dysfunction and other disorders, whether they are GI or GU disorders, are they one in the same, uh, you know, is interstitial cystitis the same as pelvic floor dysfunction? Is IBS the same as pelvic floor dysfunction? Um, maybe Dr. Pashinsky, you could comment a little bit on some of the conditions that occur either causally or, or just correlatively. Yeah, so um, this is where there could be a lot of relationships where, you know, one could cut off the other um, or they could just coexist because, you know, pelvic floor dysfunction and irritable bowel coexist quite a bit as do constipation and pelvic floor dysfunction clearly. Um, and obviously because the pelvic floor has, you know, the three compartments of, you know, the gastro, the uh, genital urinary systems, you know, kind of, you know, in, in the three compartment format more in women and kind of semi two compartment in men, uh, there will always, there will often be an interplay. So for example, you know, in a lot of men, you know, they're coming into me with, uh, you know, chronic prostatitis, which, you know, never has any bacterial cultures come out, which is really just significant tightness of the perineum. And they're also having major issues with defecation. So it's kind of that interplay, um, you know, for a lot of women, they could have irritable bowel with constipation and have an outlet problem, you know, as well. And this is why, um, you know, um, they're often seeing, 
various practitioners for their various issues. And each one is sort of looking their respective and not really asking the other questions. And um, you know, this is why when I speak to my patients, I ask about all of the systems um, and, and also some of the orthopedic issues that may go along with it, because you kind of get a sense and a picture. And when they go to see a physical therapist, they're able to put it all together because if you treat one compartment and you have dysfunction across the three, you're not going to get the patient all the way better. Terrific. Um, maybe one last question. It's more a question of practicalities. We were asked about what to do, uh, you know, if you're used to using a step stool or a squatty potty and you're at a public or out in a friend's house. Um, I'll show my age by answering first and saying, you know, when I was a fellow and a young attending, the New York City phone book was still very, very large and very widely available. And we used to get two phone books. You don't need a stool. I don't know what the hell they invented this for. Um, uh, but the question specifically was about whether you can sit on the toilet using sort of a marching action, um, which to me seems... Um, I would say prone to, to mess. Um, I, I know that I've often recommended that just leaning forward mm -hmm. is the same thing as squatting. Um, Stacy, maybe you could comment a bit on other tips for travel and recreation. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly right. I think, you know, when you, if you're sitting upright and you're bringing your knees up by putting something under your feet, it's a very similar hip to knee angle. If you kind of, keep your feet flat on the floor, but come up onto your toes and then hip hinge forward. So your elbows are resting on your knees. It can kind of provide that same angle that we're looking for, for that puborectalis muscle relaxation. It's not perfect, but it'll be, it'll be most similar to what you have at home. I also tell people to get creative because, you know, most bathrooms will have a small garbage can in there and you could easily turn that on its side or, you know, um, which will give you a little bit. Um, some people are extremely agile and they actually, you know, sort of stand on the, you know, squat on top of the toilet seat, but that is definitely not for everybody. So, um, you know, I think some variation of these probably will take care of it. Okay, one last question and, and then we'll end for time. We had a few questions regarding uh, pelvic disorders that weren't necessarily pelvic floor muscle disorder, so endometriosis or pelvic scar tissue. Certainly, muscle movement may not necessarily play in a role, but the symptoms may be similar, and certainly this can be painful. Can you comment a little bit on how you address that? So I'll, 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 I'll chime in for a second, just because um, it's not a, you know, primary gastrointestinal, et cetera, problem, the nature of the problem and having pelvic pain from endometriosis, you know, scar tissue, et cetera, often leads people to tighten up as, you know, in a secondary fashion as a downstream effect of the pain that they're experiencing. It's a guarding effect. And that leads to then muscle dysfunction. And then I'll leave to Stacy from there. No, that's, that's exactly right. It's kind of the pelvic floor dysfunction might be a sequela um, or a reaction to the pain that they're experiencing, the bloating and distension and the discomfort from the endometriosis. So a lot of times we're not, we're, we're not treating the endometriosis, but we are trying to give them strategies to manage their pain, um, soft tissue techniques that they can do at home, heat packs, um, diaphragmatic rating, things to kind of calm down their central nervous system if they're in an endometriosis flare. Um, so it's really more coping strategies and things that they can do to help them make themselves feel better, um, manual therapy within the office. But again, the, the pelvic floor is not causative of that. It's more of a um, secondary symptom um, from the endometriosis in itself. Um, the scar tissue question, Dr. Goldstein, can you just, was there a second part? Yeah, just that that was another example of you know, painful pelvic stuff, you know, patients who may have had previous pelvic surgery, GYN, bladder, rectal surgery, and scar tissue is there or things Absolutely. of that nature. Absolutely. So again, pelvic floor PT, we, we definitely have desensitization strategies that we use to sensitive scar tissue. Um, there's even soft tissue manipulation that we can do to the scar itself to kind of decrease some of the adhesions within the scar tissue. 
Um, if there is really tight, painful scar tissue, it can pull on all of the other tissues that it's attached to and cause dysfunction within the system. Um, so addressing the scar tissue head on gently and appropriately can be really beneficial to release some of the pain and tension that's happening um, on the C-section scar, on the episiotomy scar, on the appendix scar, on wh whatever surgery you've had, um, prolapse, um, repair, uh, even internally, we can, we can do things to release tension in the scar tissue gently. Terrific, thank you again. Uh, we got a lot of thank yous uh, in, the, in the chat recently here in the last few minutes. And so I just want to express that. Uh, and again, thank you both for a fantastic presentation. Uh, we wish everybody a good night. Thank you guys for tuning in and sticking with us this long. Have a good night, everybody. Um, Dr. P, that last slide, if anybody has any questions, that last slide is my contact information. Yeah. Yep. There we go. Okay. Sorry, forgot about that one. Yep, my email is there, our website information is there, that main line, um, the 212 number goes to our care coordinators who um, coordinate care for all four offices. Um, so they, can, you know, if somebody wants to make an appointment, they will um, get you on the schedule, they'll check your insurance benefits, all of that stuff. Um, that main line is for everyone. So they're like the nicest them. ever. <laughs> they are. I'm biased, but they are. Yeah, they are. Thank you guys. Stay warm, everybody. Have a good night. Yeah.